and welcome. Today's Sunday, second Sunday after Epiphany. Uh, our service begins on page 119 of your green prayer book. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Sentence for today. Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Raise your eyes, look around. Your light has come. Your light has come. Light the world, heal the earth, bear the Christ. Your light has come. Your light has come. Lift your head, raise your eyes, look around. Your light has come. Your light has come. The Lord be with you. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John, chapter 2, beginning at the first verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and, and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had come, become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. For the Gospel of the Lord. Please sit down. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that the words of my mouth and indeed the meditations of all our hearts may be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, friends, here we are again, 2022. And again, we face the uncertainty of living with a pandemic. As we survey the broad tapestry of life, we see it provides us with many different images and experiences. And I guess in lots of ways, we are going through another one of those types of experiences of life, which throws up all, all its uncertainty and all its pressure. I guess what we are going through is that phase. In this journey of life and what it throws up, I believe it's essential for us to anchor our lives somewhere. We need to have some solid, firm foundation for us to live by and understand and measure everything else that goes on around us by. And in lots of ways, the Christmas event, the coming of Christ into the world, our faith in our Lord and his coming is at the centre of that anchor. That's what it's all about. 
There are, other, of course, other anchors that we have in life as well. I hope life was good to you over Christmas and over the Christmas season, and that in spite of all the uncertainty of our times, I hope you are able to spend quality time, quality time with the people you love, um, and remind ourselves of those anchors that we have. I think in times like these, those quality times of loved ones, family, friends, become far more significant and far more special than when things are good in life, when things are not like they are now. Leslie and I drove to Sydney uh, to see my son and his, uh, and his wife, uh, daughter-in-law, and um, spent a couple of days with them. And uh, that was very delightful. We hadn't seen them for 12 months because of COVID, and um, it was a special time. And we, re we, we sort of reminisced and recalled different things that had happened, and. Um, had some lovely chats together and we talked about the marriage that I conducted at St Michael's Vaucluse in Rose Bay when I was rector there. Um, my, uh, we did that two years ago, just before COVID drove, broke out in 2019 in October. And we looked at all the photos and talked about those sorts of things and it was really nice. You know, in our gospel reading today, we have a lovely story. A story of the celebration of life. The wedding at Cana in Galilee. And here the first miracle uh, that Jesus performed, and he does it in that setting. John's Gospel miracles are called signs. Uh, signs are, and these signs are supposed to be deeper spiritual meanings of what, what they indicate. Jesus never performed these signs or these miracles just because they were magic tricks or something like that. He did it to point to the reality of God and who he was. He did it in this case to talk about his own glory, the glory of God coming into our lives, the saviour of the world. And so in lots of ways, this is the backdrop to this very first miracle that he performs in John's Gospel. John chapter 2, verses 11, 1 to 11. And we have Jesus turning up as a guest at a special celebration of a family wedding. He turns up with his disciples and his mum. While this may seem an ordinary event of life, and it is, I'm sure it's not too ordinary to the bride, to the groom, or indeed to the bride's mother, or to the bride's the groom's parents or whatever, having witnessed our own family's reaction, this his reaction, mine, to our son's wedding, and uh, not that it was stressful, it can be, but it was really a lovely time, and, and you get so excited about the whole thing. And the couples get really excited about the wedding, because it symbolises all sorts of things. So in this family celebration we have here, uh, we begin to see the picture of who Jesus is and why he came to our planet 2,100 years ago. Jesus was the sign. He was the sign of something new coming into the world. All the prophets in the Old Testament pointed to this one punctilia event that was going to happen in history. John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus becomes the sign. When God spoke from heaven at the baptism of Jesus, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am pleased. Listen to him. So why did Jesus, why did he do this miracle as the first one? Changing water in these six massive stone jars into wine. Why did he do that? Why did he do something else? At one level, it may have been when he's at this wedding feast and you can see the social interaction that's going on here. Probably all wearing masks, of course, if it was coming. And um, they're at the, at the wedding feast, and um, he got, the wine runs out. An absolute disaster. It's all the grog's gone. What are they going to do about it? So, what does he do? Um, to stop, obviously, the embarrassment of the guests, and mum comes up to him and asks him, do something about it. So there's a lot of pressure here. Well, what has that got to do with me, he sort of says. But then again, he acts. And so it could have been, so he acts because he wanted to solve the problem of what was going on and that he did, 
and they ran out of supply and they needed supply. But it was more than that. It was a signpost to a deeper and more wonderful, beautiful start to a celebration of the coming of the Messiah into our lives, the Christ event. And that was the first miracle, to demonstrate the glory of God in that environment. This water he changed into wine was not the cardboard carton variety. Uh, it was the top shelf stuff. It was the Penfolds Grange, not the other Grange that I gave you the other day, Vivian. Um, it, was the, it was the Penfolds Grange variety. The six jars, the six large kegs, if you like, were used normally, not normally for drinking, but they were used for the Jewish rite of purification, where they would wash their hands when they came in after being out. And that was a purification thing of not being sullied with the sins of the world, but going back into your family and home and things like that. So that's what the jars were used for. And Jesus, on the request of his mother, who asked his son to do something about it, John, in writing this gospel story, would have been quite aware at the time in the ancient Near East and the Greek and Roman world, wine was, he said, was an essential ingredient in lots of ways for the success of any celebration or family life. You might find that strange, but it's true. Philo said this of wine. I'll just quote this. Philo said, the delight, the sweetening, the exhilaration, the merriment, the ambrosian drug, whose medicine gives joy and gladness. It was Philo said that. Maybe John had Philo's comments in mind when he told this first story. Who knows? It certainly gives us a clear snapshot in lots of ways and how people celebrated life in that first century. How the gap between the Jewish and Greek cultures merged in these ordinary events in life. But these were loving family events as well. Now this first miraculous sign Jesus does here gives us an image of how we should also reach out to our community as Christians with the good news of Jesus. That his kingdom has arrived. Salvation has come like the introduction of good vintage wine at a wedding feast. That's the idea of the coming of Christ into the world. So this story, in lots of ways, gives us a type of wonderful message of how we should share the good news of Christ to the world. Now let me explain that for a little bit. When we speak to people about Jesus or bringing Jesus to people, how do we see that message today? How do you understand that message? How do you market that message, if you like? I mean, in our times, we are so influenced by popular negative imagery, quite often of the church, perhaps the churches, churches wowsers, Bible bashers, fanatics, goody two-shoes, or even hypocrites. This marketing neg negativity of Christianity is out there in the secular world. We know that. And we have to push back against that all the time. Yet when I read this story of the wedding of Cana in Galilee, it gives me a beautiful and refreshing, confident image of the gospel. We are here, we are here challenged to think again differently about our mission and our role as a church in the world in this one little passage. What this story asks the reader to do is to embark on a pilgrimage. Not of negativity, not of wowserism, not of any of those negative images, but to, em to embark on a pilgrimage of beauty. A pilgrimage of beauty. Now let's think about it in this way. Let me ask you this question. What does Cinderella at the ball or princesses kissing frogs or ugly ducklings becoming swans have in common. All three of these lovely little children's stories describe a pilgrimage of beauty. Why does the delightful story of Cinderella, which I recently shared with Pippa, our granddaughter, endear itself to hearts of millions of people around the world? Because a persistent prince 
is able to transform a lowly, unkempt, awkward servant girl into a charming, beautiful, graceful princess. That's the story. It's a pilgrimage of beauty. Whether it's the princesses kissing frogs, or ugly ducklings becoming swans, or a few Cinderella's becoming bells of the ball, beauty is always the irresistible outcome in those stories. In all ancient and modern writings, beauty's secrets are priceless. Not necessarily cosmetic, we're talking about here. We're talking about beauty, inner beauty. Inner beauty. That sort of beautiful thing. Its presence is magnetic. It should come as no surprise then that God's strategy for evangelism and mission involves a beautiful bride. Here as the first story of God's salvation. The story of a wedding celebration. The imagery of the church being the bride and Christ being the bridegroom or God being the groom are constant biblical images throughout the Bible. So friends, the first miracle about the beautiful bride and the joy of a wedding feast is is at the essence of what the gospel is about and the fulfilment of all those predictions and that relationship that God has with his people. Because in lots of ways, the image of a bride bypasses intellects and captures hearts, does it not? That's the whole sort of thing that we try to put together. I mean, the tough, callous, hardened people are known to weep in the presence of joy. I cried at my son's Um, Men of steel and their wives get misty-eyed. Ideally, a bride is the epitome of, or a symbol in that setting. And I, I see it constantly over the 40 years of being a priest in the church. I see it constantly of the, the, the whole imagery of what we try to set up in a wedding celebration is exactly this. Of all, all that is right and beautiful in the world, we try to have that message in that ceremony. The bride is a symbol of purity, hope, purpose, trust, love, beauty, wholeness, in a world pockmarked by ugliness. We try to say something different in a symbolic way, in that way. The wedding and the bride motive, found in both the Old Testament and New Testament, is used by God to illustrate his purpose and his strategy for attracting people to his kingdom and the availability of his changing, his life-changing grace, transforming grace. When we saw this first sign of John in the Gospel at a wedding in Cana, this starts with a pilgrimage, this whole thing, this Gospel message of God coming into our lives. There's nothing negative about it. It starts with a pilgrimage of us to beauty, for us becoming... God's beautiful creatures is what it's about. That's what it's about. God transforming us into his beautiful creatures. The name of God's bride in the Old Testament, of course, is Israel. And in the New Testament, it is the church, you and me. Both Israel and the church are described as the brides whose beauty is traced and can only be understood because of God's love for them. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God's love for them makes them beautiful, makes us beautiful, transforms us into his beautiful creatures. It is fitting, therefore, for Jesus to perform this first miracle at a wedding banquet. Can you see that? Makes sense now. So, friends, as we start this new year with all its uncertainty, And at times, ugliness. What is your image? A role of the church in the world. What is your image of yourself as one of God's creatures on this planet? How should we market ourselves then? How should we market ourselves? I mean, after all, our product is Christ, is he not? Not a negative image, but an image of beauty. An image which transfers beauty. The bride and the bridegroom. He is the new wine, the good wine, 
To know him is a cause of celebration, a cause of rejoicing, a cause of gladness and joy. Jesus is the real deal, the agent of change. There is nothing comparable to his love because it transforms frogs into princesses, princes, ducklings into swans, drab servant girls into princesses. Yet, friends, our mission, if you choose to accept it, is to call on all people to share with us on that pilgrimage to true beauty. No matter how much we are broken by sin or sickness or hardship, no matter how much life does not give us what we need it to, no matter how much we feel under pressure from other people and things that are going on in our world, none of us, none of us are excluded from the love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's love in Christ in this new wine, the catalyst which makes a pilgrimage towards wholeness, eternal life, humanly possible. So friends, as we look at 2022, let's go forward in strength and knowledge that we have a different picture of the power of God in our life and the pilgrimage of beauty that we are all on. It's an inner peace, it's a beauty. It's that very thing that God will give us which has absolute eternal dimensions and it's what we should anchor our life into. And may God bless us as we do that together in 2022. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Great things he has taught us, great things he has